welcome everybody to the uh, September 10th public hearing solar farm for Swan Road and the September 10th work session. Do we need to read? We'll go to the, right to the public hearing. Do we need to read the public hearing again, or it's open? It's, it's been open, so we don't need to. No, this was read at the beginning of the okay. last hearing. Okay. Okay. So I have uh, for the privilege of the floor, and I believe everybody is for the public hearing. We'll start with Susan Sly. This slide would just step closer to the mic. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to bring up some things yeah. today as to why, my, why I am against this project. Um, I researched the Town of Lewiston has a comprehensive plan um, and their guidelines. Hold on one second. There you go. And there are guidelines that assess current and future policies and decisions that are made for the Town of Lewiston. Um, uh, they're recommended as a basis for making land use and zoning decisions. Um, I'm located on page six of the ag agricultural land use. The town of Lewiston supports agricultural as an important component of the town. It con contributes to rural character and is a significant element to the town's economy. Policies should discourage converting active agricultural lands to non agricultural use and encourage the maintenance of state agricultural districts established under Agricultural and Markets Law, Article 25 AA, as tools in support of farming. And what, I, what I understand from this is basically you're taking away viable farmland by installing solar panels. Um, I asked for references last meeting from Lindsay here of past projects. She sent me one project from Houghton College, and from my understanding, when I reviewed that, it was a project that generated 2.3 megawatts, and it was used primarily for their college. Very few uh, community residents benefited from that because they were using it for them as their institution. And they were located in a rural area next to a throughway. And it's totally unlike our neighborhood. Um, it was, so it's very uncharacteristic, the reference that she sent me. Um, I have a lot of concerns. Um, again, I mentioned it last week uh, about the noise. Um, they're saying it's 60 decibels, and as you get away from it, it lowers. Um, and they say it's an ambient noise. A constant humming, in my mind, is not an ambient noise. You know, ambient noise would be the birds, the crickets, the frogs that I experience in my neighborhood, not constant humming of a generator, transformer, or whatever it may be. Um, I'm concerned about the visual um, aesthetics out there. Um, the solar panels don't look like corn or soybeans. Right. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of issues. Um, property values, we're concerned about property values going down. Who wants to buy a, move to a rural area and, you know, live next to an industrial, basically, plot of land. Um, <coughs> this property uh, will not generate taxes, so to me, I think that takes away. It, it puts burden on other residents in the community. Put up more there. So I understand we're going to give the town a stipend, but that's going to go in the town's funds. Um, it's a totally separate account. Um, I, again, I bring up the conflict of interest. If there's any issues or problems, according to the solar law, you're supposed to be able to go to the building inspector and discuss these concerns. Again, the solar field is being placed on, on the building inspector's land. Um, there's supposed to be yearly inspections that are done by the building inspector. Again, it's his property that it's on, and how he inspects his own stuff. Um, uh, they were offering a 10% discount, um, and if you do the math, it probably comes out to be about 20 or $40 a year per resident. I don't see that as a significant savings to the residents. Um, I think most of the power generated is going to go to their company and then to the power grid, you know? And the power grid may not be operating at 100% now, but if you allow these solar farms to come in and they start, um, you know, generating their power, the, the grid's gonna 
not accept anymore. Um, so I, I have concerns over that. I have concerns over the lighting at night that, that this facility may use. Um, you know, the, the lighting out when you're in the rural area, it's dark, you see stars. That you, let, you know, it's clear. I don't want to have to look at, you know, the lighting that they're going to have some type of security, I would imagine, to protect it. Um, I have issues with, um, it's located, the uh, east side is all, if, if I can point up here. Yeah, go ahead. Thing. Uh, this is on my property here. It's all wooded. Well, and this is a lot of um, ash trees. And we all know what happened to the ash trees in the community. The emerald ash bugs just destroyed them. I've got a lot, a lot of trees here. They're very tall, and, and there are no leaves. They're, de they're dead. And I have a concern that these trees could fall over and now be a liability because I'd be responsible for replacing all these panels. And that's, you know, if you ever drive by or would drive by, you'll see. Um, I was told by Tim that my trees aren't 100 feet tall, that they wouldn't impact it, but, you know, I don't have that insurance. You know, that's a, to me, that's a liability. I've had a tree fall over the back of my property on someone's fence, and I had the insurance, their insurance carrier at my, my door wanting me, you know, thousands of dollars for a tree that I can't even see that's 1,500 feet off my property. So I have the same concern for here, you know. That if my tree falls over and damages those, it's going to be an expensive liability for me to contend trying to repair that. Um, <coughs> I, I, got, I had a couple issues with the conflicts of the solar laws. Um, they talk about uh, for ground mounted that, that they're not supposed to exceed 10 foot. I can bring up it's 360-218C5. Um, so I have a question about that. The you know, lawyer could, could answer that. And 306-218C7, it says the total surface area should, shall not exceed 5% of the total lot area. And obviously this is much larger than that. Um, the solar law 360-225F says it's only supposed to be located in the rear of the lot. Yeah. That looks to be on the side of the front portion there, where all the transformers are, I believe. <clears throat> and, I, and like I said, so with all these issues, I, I just don't feel like this is a proper place for it. You've got a picture there, and um, it looks like you've taken away the corn. Uh, last week, the last session we had uh, fields of corn, which you wouldn't be able to see probably the panels with the corn, but without the corn, yeah, you'll be seeing those panels. But um, again, I just, with all those issues, I just don't feel like this is a good fit for our neighborhood. I think it's a liability. I don't think it's fair for the neighbors. Um, I just don't think there, there's probably better suited properties in, in a more industrial area that this project belongs in. And with that, I'd just like you to consider those, those um, thoughts and Remember your comprehensive plan. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Oh, I have Stephanie and Corey Henry, 1855 Swan Road. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I guess, yeah, I brought up those, um, the solar laws there. Good question for the attorney. I guess I would say that applies to ground mounted solar energy systems and the, um, of the smaller scale not the utility scale, so those aren't applicable to this project. I thought I was reading under the utility scale when I pulled out these. I thought that was the utility scale that I was referencing. No, that's just the general criteria. Um, Can you use the mic, please? 306-218-C7, three, three <coughs> that was not a utility regulation. That's not for a utility scale. That's if you, as a homeowner, just wanted to do. You could you could build that with just a permit, and you wouldn't have to go through the whole process of a, a public hearing and getting a special use permit and getting the site plan approval and everything like that. So, the that's for 
not a utility scale. I mean, I, I guess I'll that doesn't apply. It's not for utility scale. All right, I'll go back and, and pull that up then and read that because I was under, I believe I was pulling up the utility scale. Yeah. Susan, let me tell you this. Uh, we're not going to make a decision tonight. <coughs> so you can, we're going to, but we are going to close the public hearing tonight after it's done. So you can call me and come in and talk to me. I, you know, um, yeah, I talked to Tobin quite a while the other day, so you can come in and talk to him with any, you know, if you research and so on. But we are going to close the public hearing check, but no decisions can be made. Okay. Okay? Right, no, okay. Thank you. Stephanie and Corey Henry. most of our concerns, but um, just a couple things I'd like to add and some questions. Um, we did look up the solar energy law that was adopted by the town of Lisbon this year, and um, under the setback requirements for utility scale solar energy systems, it says that from any residential district, which I believe that we are in the rural residential district, um, a minimum of 200 feet from all property lines bordering the used district is supposed to be maintained. <coughs> I looked at the site plan, and from what I understand, we're only I only see a 100-foot setback from all those property lines. So I had a question as to how that is allowed when the, the code says 200 feet. Um, other than that, we would ask for landscaping screening, if possible, to limit um, the view for us and as well as neighbors across the street for the solar panels. Uh, we also have um, a one-year-old daughter and we have concerns. If there's health concerns for the solar panels, if any of the chemicals that they're made out of could you know, go into the soil through water runoff or anything like that. Um, Sorry, I can't pronounce the last name. Tim? Is it Cantrell? Cantrell. Cantrell? Is it C A N T R I L? T R I I L L. Okay. I got band hat, Brownie. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tim Cantrell. I'm a member of Local 237. I've worked on a few of these projects before. I've worked, uh, the last one I worked on was out in Massachusetts of this size. Uh, something this size for my members is going to generate. For like 40 to 60 jobs for us. And since this is infrastructure spending, every dollar on infrastructure spending usually in the local economy generates two to three dollars of outgrowth. So a lot of this is going to come right back into your guys' local community. I'd, uh, I'd like to see this thing go because it'd be great for my members. Uh, that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Fred Dumais. I'm also a member of uh, the IDW, and I, uh, Tim, pretty much covered everything. We just we're we're looking to benefit uh, for our, for our neighbors, for our uh, um, and our members. They just uh, what it what it would it doesn't seem like much that this you know we just come into work for just a little bit of time. Everybody seems to think that a lot of things we hear that the uh, the jobs or the the work is just temporary. But it means all our work is temporary, and it just goes, you know, from, you know, it may only last like a few months, and it doesn't seem like a lot. But it's just that's how our work is. We just go from one job to another, and it, it may only last a few months. It may last a year, but it just produces, you know, produces work for our members. Thank you. Thank you. Tobin Gormley, 1962 Swan. My name is Tobin Gormley, I live in 1962 Swan Road, as depicted right here. And actually, right now, this is all corn, and it's beautiful. I love corn. Lewiston loves corn. <laughs> okay. um, I have some documents that I wanted to go through. Um, Susan touched on one of them. Uh, the future vision map uh, with respect to the 
comprehensive plan. The approach of this comprehensive plan is to provide a more general future vision map. The vision map in this document provides sufficient guidance to direct the type of development that is envisioned for different areas of the town while remaining flexible enough to accommodate changing circumstances. The vision map is intended to identify opportunities and priorities for sectors of the town, so the character of those areas remains true to the town's vision for them. In general, and this is with respect to where I reside, the eastern sector of the town is identified as rural, agricultural, and character. Development in the eastern portion of the town, generally east of Porter Center Road, should strive to maintain that rural atmosphere. For example, design work, and design should work around natural features and attempt to preserve this, these natural features where feasible. Agricultural and rural residential uses are preferred over commercial uses. There's a map, uh, you can find this document online. I would assume you guys have all seen it and been trained on it. Well, when you look at the map, it's shown and there, there we are, all rural agricultural. A little bit different than what that map up there is showing right now. Um, with respect to special use permits, it says in the document that the criteria provide the town with greater control over the implementation of problematic uses, facilitating the ability to institute buffers or other controls, which you and I spoke about, Steve, to minimize impacts from development to neighboring uses. That's important to me is what we're going to see. Or maybe we won't see it. With respect to economic land use, on page five of this document, it states, the town of Lewiston supports new industry and businesses. Industrial development should be carefully planned to ensure adequate buffers, setbacks, and landscaping, again, what we talked about, and to minimize any negative impacts. But then it goes on to say, with respect to agricultural land use, the town of Lewiston supports agriculture as an important component of the town. It contributes to the rural character and is a significant element of the town's economy. Policy should discourage converting active agricultural lands to non-agricultural use and encourage the maintenance of state agricultural districts, districts established under Agricultural and Markets Law 25AA as in tools that support farming. Page 25, uh, I'm sorry, enough of that document. Falling asleep. This is important to me. This all started with the town of Wheatfield. I know that you guys had to put something in place because you got these companies coming into town saying, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put up these solar energy farms, not plants, they want to call them farms. Well, the town of Wheatfield took this one on and came up with essentially a boilerplate document that the town of Lewiston adopted and then made their own subsequent changes, like anybody would. But of interest, what I find in the Town of Wheatfield's document, which was issued on January 1st, or excuse me, January 12th, 2017, they define solar sky space, and I spoke to Steve about this, as the space between a solar collector and the sun through which solar radiation passes. It's a pretty simple definition. Somebody in the Town of Lewiston took it upon themselves to add to that definition, to change it a little bit, and add the word easement. So it's solar sky space easement. And that's a right expressed as an easement covenant condition for other property interests. Da, da, da. I guess my point is it's now a right to those rays of the sun being granted and protected. You don't have that anywhere else. But you have it here. You have it in this document with the town of Lewiston. The town of Wheatfield doesn't word it that way. They don't have it that way. But you guys do. I don't know why it was worded that way. I assume for legal reasons you cover your bases, you run the gamut. Well, that, that's what's happening here. It's a right now. Um, on page 6, I, the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of any solar energy system shall prevent the misdirection and or reflection of solar rays onto neighboring properties, public roads, and public parks in excess of which already exist. Well, where and how is this guaranteed? And what about enforcement? I don't know by looking at that diagram, maybe it's been brought up before, 
So which way are those panels facing? Southeast or southwest? Does anybody know? Which way? They just face towards the southwest and then submitted documents for the application of the Glare study, which uh, was included in the uh, application of the Glare study indicated there was no adverse effects to neighbors. The study, the study. indicates that. The Glare study. Okay. We could do a study after the rough, but I, I, I appreciate, I respect that. You did a study before yeah. the rough. Um, under special use permits, page seven. The issuance of a special use permit does not constitute solar sky space rights, and the town shall not be responsible for ensuring impermissible obstruction to the solar sky space as a result or uses or development performed in accordance with town code. So the right exists, but this also says that the special permit in this case will not grant them solar sky space rights. Uh, if that's the site plan, I don't know if there's a more detailed one, but it says under section C, page 8, a site plan drawn in sufficient detail as follows. Proposed fencing and or screening for said project. Well, I see the fencing, but I don't see any screening on there. Unless that, has that been added? Since our last, since the public hearing, from the last, about two weeks ago, uh, at the behest or at the request of the town, Borrego had a landscape plan drawn up to add landscaping for screening, and that's reflected on that print there. Uh, I, as, as a guy that lives right across the street, I was in construction for almost three decades, I'd like to see cut views, like to see something more detailed than some, you know, magic marker triangles <coughs> along the perimeter of the fence, which I appreciate, but i definitely like to see a well, this, came, this came out of the meeting with you and I as well. You guys Thanks. talked yeah. afterwards, and you and I talked. So, they list, you know, they listen to what we had to say. They listen to what you had to say. Okay. So it's going to be, we're going to basically require it to be along the um, the, the parameters, parameters, uh, parameters that you and I discuss. Okay. Is there any kind of guarantee that that's what will be in place? Well, yeah, it'll be part of the it'll be part of the requirement. So that will be a written requirement that'll be in effect that they'll be agreeing to. Yes. And agreeing to. I, I believe they have. They have information tonight. And well, you don't have to do it now. We can do it when they're done. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would it, appreciate it. Because there's a couple of questions that I'm going to ask them to, to explain. All right. Um, to, I'll move as quickly as I can. D, for all utility scale solar systems, the applicant shall submit a decommissioning plan for review and approval as part of the special use permit application. The decommissioning plan shall identify that, 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 that. I have a copy. If you know. I have a copy. So you do know the decommissioning costs at present? And in the projected for 25 years down the road, I'll show you the decommissioning plan. It's better, you know, it basically covers, you know, any increase in, in price and all that. So I'll show it to you. I, I, I made a copy for it. I forgot, you know, I didn't get it to you. Can I, can I ask, is this something that the town calculated or is this something Grego uh, calculated? I believe that the solar company themselves would be the ones who, they have to get a bond, they have to put the decommissioning right. plan in place, they have right. to get a bond, they have to review the plan every and submit years. a new one every five years. Right. The town would review that if we felt that the bond was yeah. substantially inadequate, we of course would let them know it, and that would be part of our town engineering uh, function is, if, if, if that bond was inadequate, we would let them know and they would they'd be required to increase okay. that. So at this point, they calculated the costs. You'll review them and say, this looks adequate, this doesn't look adequate, and they'll be addressed there. Yeah, the town. Okay. Um, I don't know if the public is aware of this, but page 9D, and I know this project may differ, maximum overall height with respect to these structures. The height of a utility scale solar energy system, which this is, utility scale, not residential, not the, the nut down the street that wants to put two panels in that's been reading popular mechanics for the past 50 years. But it says the height of the utility scale solar energy system shall not exceed 20 feet when orientated at maximum tilt. 20 feet. So if this one's 9 feet, 10 feet, so be it. I'm still not thrilled about that. But 20 feet. I hope everybody's aware that they could get a special use permit next to them with a 20 foot panel with a 100 or hopefully 200 some foot buffer between them. 20 feet, almost as, as high as some homes, or higher. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know who wrote this, but it's different from the other townships. Some ways it's similar, but that's awful high. <coughs> if it's out in the middle of nowhere, so be it. But when it's right next to your home, 20 feet's kind of high. 
Um, with respect to a berm, landscape, or other opaque enclosure, a P, page 10, or any combination thereof, acceptable to the town, capable of screening the site, it may be required. It sounds like you guys are going to require that, and I'm thankful for this, uh, along any property line that abuts an existing residence. Um, that's my biggest request, is that, that th those controls are in place and that they are not minimized in any way, shape, or form, that they go up that we don't. We don't have to look at this. Every time I look at my window, I see you guys. I don't see them. I don't see the panels. I see you guys. You know. Um, also of importance, T, page 11. Clearing, grading, stormwater, and erosion control. The ditch to the west of this property has been needed to be cleaned since I've been there in 1995, 1996. And it hasn't been. And I think it needs to be addressed. And with respect to erosion and water control, um, I found something uh, from the EPA. I'll tell you what I'll get into first. I know that from Borrego's perspective, this is all good. It's you know butterflies and uh, polar bears, and it's all green. And you can't argue against green, and I'm not trying to do that. But when I go to their very own website and go to their Frequently Asked Questions page, why is solar being developed in land and, on land in rural areas? Building conventional power plants to meet our growing energy needs is hurting our environment and our health. Well, last I knew, we already have the fourth largest hydroelectric power plant in the United States. We're not hurting for the generation of green power here. So I'll be honest with you, as far as I'm concerned, that doesn't apply. Maybe in New York C City, but out our way, we are not hurting for green energy in any way, shape, or form. <clears throat> they go into common concerns about the public thinking that this will ruin the pastoral landscape. And they go on to say, even though community solar farms provide multiple community benefits, some may think that they're visually unattractive or industrial looking. We alleviate these concerns by planting tree vegetation buffers as well as pollinator habitats. Again, I absolutely want to see these controls put in place. I didn't know when I did my own review that this was absolutely going to happen. They mentioned misconceptions. That the panels can't be put in landfills. Well, Borrego says the industry is turning to recycling as the primary option for disposing of solar panels, uh, but modules are accepted at landfills. Well, I'll tell you what, I called Modern Disposal. They're one of the largest uh, you know, places around here that I could think of. They're pretty close in proximity. They cannot and will not take these panels. They're not prepared for it, they're not qualified for it, they're not licensed for it. So it's not just a simple little panel that goes into a garbage bag and gets taken away by the garbage man. It's not going to happen. Modern's not going to take it. Somebody else is going to. And those costs will be incurred with that, that bond, uh, as shown in that bond. They write that people are concerned that the system negatively impacts property values. Now, this, this is of importance to me, most importance. There isn't any evidence that this is true. On the contrary, there are studies that show, now listen carefully, that properties with solar on them can be worth more since those panels provide credits to the owner paying the utility bill. You see how they, they worded that? The guy with the panels, yeah, he's making money. His property's worth more. But they don't address the surrounding property values. It's very clever. But some people aren't that dumb. It doesn't just sail on by without you know, recognizing what they're saying. It carefully avoids the values of the surrounding properties and how they can decline. In my view, that's a little bit disingenuous. I wouldn't expect them to address that, and they don't. Before I came here, this was in my mailbox. I don't know if it got delivered or if somebody put it in there. Honestly, this came today. I don't know if anybody else got this card. I don't know. It says, let's keep the wheat in wheat field. They're going through the same thing as we are. I don't know if any of you got it. But just to let you know, we're not the only ones that might be a little bit concerned about what's going to take place. That said, if this is going to happen, I do want to see the money kept in the community. The Brotherhood that's here, the electrical workers, they're the most qualified guys to do this. I want to see them here. We've got union members that are here. We've got union members that came here for this meeting. I don't want to see people bust in from Guatemala or some third world country to do this for $10 or $15 an hour. I'd like to see our local brothers and sisters 
do the work. So hopefully it'll be competitive in the bid. Um, and Marego has no issue with paying a premium for premium work. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. I need a motion to close the public hearings. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Oh, you want to speak? I want okay, to speak. come on up to my phone, give us your name. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Daniel Sanger. Um, your address? At 1901 Ridge Road. Okay. It's a 90 acre farm directly across. I'll show you. Okay. This farm goes from here. Here. Okay. So I, I own like six lots directly across from Boa Solar. Um, I just got to tell you. I really don't want that to happen. Um, there's a lot of issues. Uh, has there been any studies done for you know like the value of the properties over there, like my my lots? Is there going to be is there any studies on that? Does anybody know what's going to happen to the property value? Anybody know? We've not done a study. Well, I mean. You know, I just, I, you know, like the whole, uh, I don't know, the um, stewardship of the land. You know, I'm a farmer, and I hate to see good farmland just go. You know, that's going to be a 25-year thing. You know, it's, you know, right down there below the ridge, it's all a microclimate. It's special land. It really is. And um, it's just, you know, they're not making any more of that land, period. And was it your farm that was approached also? Yes. And what were the reasons why you chose not to? I mean, you know, I guess 